The Football World Cup's the biggest sporting event in the world, and you can keep up with the play with me, Jason Pine, and my good mate and former All White David Choate on Football Fever. Listen daily throughout the World Cup as we bring you all the action from Qatar. Choate and I love football. We can't wait for the World Cup to get underway. So join us as we live through all the goals, all the drama, all the glory. Download Football Fever from iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts. One of the features of this World Cup and top-level football in recent times has been the increased use of technology, including the video assistant referee or the VAR, semi-automated offside technology, and sensors now inside the actual football, and they collect spatial positioning data in real time. Now, Victoria University in Melbourne was recently named as the first university in the world to become an official FIFA research institute for football technology. And Professor Robert Augie is a key researcher at the university who has collaborated for several years with FIFA on leading edge football technologies. And he joins us now. Uh, Rob, thanks for taking the time. Uh, Maybe you can start by telling us what your work with FIFA actually involves. Yeah, look, uh, it's been a, been quite a few years now, but it's basically around the accuracy of the technology that FIFA wants to be able to then roll out in football competition. And in that regard, then, uh, is it uh, is it constant communication with the the powers that be at FIFA, or do they give you projects to work on? How does that all work? Uh, yeah, look, there's, there's certainly annual things that we do for them. So there's an annual test event that we run for the athlete tracking side, which is basically you know, the position of players on the pitch and the speed that they're actually moving at. Um, so that, that basic sort of information. Uh, and, and so what we do is we invite, or FIFA, and, and we invite providers uh, of that sort of technology to test events uh, each year. So that, that's the, sort of the mainstay of what we do. But then there's, there's a number of other projects that really come to us uh, on a needs basis from FIFA. And the semi-automated uh, offside technology was a great example of that this year. Yeah, I want to talk about that in a second. But but how deeply embedded in football now has technology become? Oh, re- really deep. Um, from from both on on the pitch during matches, but then also in the training facility as well. So there's a, a whole range of daily uses of the technology in the training environment, just around the, the preparation of the athletes and and monitoring and controlling how much load they actually place on their bodies. Um, through to making training as match-like as possible where, where that's appropriate, and then strategic things during matches as well. So it's not just about how fast the player runs or, or um, where they're positioned, but where they're positioned relative to their teammates, relative to the opposition, relative to the ball, uh, and how those things change uh, within the course of a match as well. Have you found that uh, the desire for data of this sort has um, has grown? There's a greater desire among among coaching staffs in particular to understand, you know, more and more about the players and, and the games that they play in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as the technology is developed and, and the technology is now, um, it's pretty pretty robust and and certainly believable in the data that that we're getting from it. Um, so once there's a belief that there's accuracy enough to, to be able to use for, for different purposes, then, yeah, teams are, are really crying out for it. And, look, there's a range of capacity within uh, individual teams and even nations at the World Cup, for example, to be able to process and use that particular data as well. Semi-automated offside technology. Uh, we've seen uh, seen it in action at this FIFA World Cup, and, and the graphics on the screen that uh, that you know show us the the body part or parts that are offside um, relative to the last defender. Um, I mean, what does the back end of this look like, Rob? It must be an incredibly complicated set of set of variables that go together to even get a graphic like that. Uh, yeah, definitely. So the, the particular provider that's uh, engaged at the World Cup has, has a lot of experience in doing this across multiple sports, but the missing link in, and that's only really become available in the, in the last little while is, is that we call it skeletal tracking, where they effectively track you know 20 plus different points on the body. Uh, and of course, in football, it's, it's the scoring points of the body. So you know, anything, of course, as, as you know, uh, apart from, from the T-shirt lying down on the arm is, is a scoring part of the body. So they need to be able to track that accurately um, on every player uh, on the pitch, um, attacking and defending players in real time, uh, and also the location of the ball. So it's, yeah, it's a very complex undertaking. 
how is that done? How how are the points on a player's body or all of the players' bodies tracked? Is it is it in stadium? Yeah, so um, the provider that's being used at the World Cup, and there are there are a few around the world that, that actually have the capacity to do this, uh, use video systems. So they have multiple cameras set up in the stadium, uh, and from that they're able to to train their their system uh, on on what people look like. Um, so it starts at, sort of at that phase in the development phase. This is a person. These are the limbs on the person. These are where they were at any given time with different types of movement. So they. They basically train the smarts behind the technology. Um, so it's not so much the cameras they use, but it's more uh, the actual algorithms that they use to tell the system that this is a player and these are the limbs. Can the technology, not just in, in the semi-automated offside um, situation, but any football technology, can it be wrong? Can it, can it get it wrong? Um, I, I, I'm not sure that it can get it wrong uh, in that we, we know how accurate the, the technology is and unfortunately I can't give you a a number on that, um, but I'm, I'm very confident that the, you know, the semi-automated offside stuff, for example, is um, certainly better than an assistant referee running along the side of the pitch uh, who's looking from a particular perspective and, and m- might even be occluded uh, from being able to see what's going on at any given time. So the technology is certainly more accurate than that. Um, there's always the possibility of the technology failing, if you like, and, and in that particular case, then we, we go back to the default and the referees uh, make their decision. I want to ask you about a couple of incidents, um, specific ones at this World Cup. Uh, Japan's winner against Spain in pool play, it looked for all the world as though the ball had gone over the byline before the Japanese player crossed it back in for his teammate to score from close range. Um, why, was that, why was that goal allowed to stand? Uh, well, that's um, slightly different in a way. And looking at the goal line technology in, in that particular example, and um, the whole ball, of course, needs to be over the line for it to be out of play. Uh, and the angles that, that um, many fans have seen, and it's been on social media, it's gone pretty viral of, of different angles that appear to show that the ball is actually out of play. But, of course, remembering that the ball is spherical, it doesn't have a flat surface, uh, that... You know, the, the bottom of the ball can be over the line, but part of the ball would not have crossed that line just because it's, it's a sphere. Uh, so the, the technology itself is able to detect probably a lot more accurately in this case than humans can with the naked eye. And, and, and that's an example of the technology, I guess, superseding uh, the, the human intervention in that particular case, that it's more accurate than the human eye. So it gives a slightly different uh, answer. In the pool game between Portugal and Uruguay, a uh, cross came in from Bruno Fernandes from Portugal. Cristiano Ronaldo, um, well, <laughs> he appeared to claim that he'd got a got a head on it. Uh, the goal was later given to Fernandes, so there was clearly proof that Cristiano Ronaldo hadn't touched the ball. Were the sensors inside the ball able to confirm that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the sensors inside the ball, so the accelerometer, for example, inside the ball is incredibly... Um, responsive to movement of the ball and, and impacts on the ball. Uh, so it's the same sort of technology that you know, we have in our mobile phones, for example, with accelerometers built into them, that if you happen to drop your phone, then it will shut the processor down a little bit so that it doesn't damage that uh, while, while it's being you know, dropped and, and impacting on the ground. So the technology itself inside the ball has been around for a long, long time. We're talking back to the initial space program in the U.S., um, so accelerometers themselves aren't new, but it's the application of them inside the ball that's new. And, and you know, for, a, for a football, you need to be able to suspend that particular sensor inside the ball, which is, is quite tricky, but has been, uh, they've been able to do it with the Adidas ball they're using in the World Cup. So, so yeah, really, really easily can determine from that data that, um, no, he didn't get a touch on it now. Maybe one of his hairs got a touch on it. I don't know if that's enough to claim it, but uh, that, the sense is not going to pick that up. The, yeah, I mean, the easier thing would have been for Ronaldo to tell his teammates he hadn't got a touch, but but he clearly wasn't in any mood to do that. Sort of like, this is sort of like Snicko, isn't it, in cricket? You know, is it, is it a similar kind of technology? Um, now, Snicko just relies on the audio. Right. Um, so it's just, just picking up a sound. But in terms of the semi-automated offside stuff, um, it's, it's very, very similar to what's used in, in other um, sports. So cricket with the LBW decision is a great example where you, you, know, you have to be able to track the ball. Uh, so that, that becomes quite, 
quite a difficult undertaking. Tennis, the same. Um, you know, Australian Open, for example, that Hawkeye um, do the you know, was, was the ball in or out uh, on on calls and can overall overrule the the umpire in, in tennis. And, and I guess that technology is universally accepted as the ground truth in those sports. You know, you go review a decision in cricket and. If um, the DRS says that it's out and, and was given not out, then the umpire changes his decision. And I think that we'll, we'll get to that stage quite quickly in football as well when there's just a, an acceptance of the accuracy and the robustness of the technology. A lot of people, Rob, would say and do say that VAR has taken the emotion out of football and that the euphoria of scoring goals for players and certainly for fans has to be tempered by the chance of it being ruled out by a VAR check. What's your view on that? Um, look, I, I think certainly the immediate emotion is, is affected, but you still get the emotion. Um, and in fact, you might get additional emotion if something is overturned. Um, so you can go from the uh, euphoric high to the euphoric low, I suppose, <laughs> uh, in that particular example. So it's definitely changed. There's no, there's no question it's changed, but I, I don't think it's taken the emotion out. I think it's just changed it. And when a VAR check's being done, fans in the grounds and watching on TV are pretty much in the dark as to what's being looked at. They can see the pictures on the screen, but they can't hear the conversation between referee and VAR. Should we be able to hear that discussion? Do you think that would be an improvement? Um, yeah, look, it's an interesting one. I'm, I'm certainly all for transparency in, in how the technology is used. Um, now, FIFA, of course, might, might have a slightly different view at the moment. Um, so I'm certainly not speaking on their behalf, but um, yeah, I, I think that actually adds to the theatre of it uh, as well, and and potentially you get more crowd engagement if they can hear what's actually being said, and 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 probably more acceptance ultimately of okay, well, what they said sounds reasonable. Um, I'm happy with the decision they've ended up with. Yeah, one hundred percent. That's I think the that's the the argument, if you can call it that, that most fans would say. That's okay, well, we can understand that. We can hear the conversation and, yeah, okay, we get what you're saying. So that might take a little bit of the uh, the uncertainty and the lack of transparency out of it. Looking ahead, Rob, are there further developments of technology that you would like to see used in the game of football? Oh, yeah. Um, look, there's, there's, I guess there's all sorts of things that are possible and, and even just with the limb tracking that's used in the semi-automated offside technology at the moment, uh, there's companies around the world, instead of having, say, 20 points on the body that uh, that they're actually measuring, they're looking at effectively uh, a, a thousand or more or 10,000 points on the body that they can be looking at simultaneously. So it's really, it's just an improvement in the models that they use and the algorithms that they use um, to describe the, the body in motion. So that will become more accurate uh, over time. So I, I think that just the more accuracy is going to be great. It, it's already absolutely usable in the game but uh, as we get more accurate and faster uh, I think that you know we, we get to the point where the potential for you know some automatic refereeing decisions to be made um, and and really just rely a little bit more heavily on the tech uh, and certainly from the training uh, perspective and, and even an injury perspective the better these models become the more chance we have of, of determining how a player got injured um, so what were the mechanisms that caused an injury for example so uh, I think that's going to be a big step forward in trying to protect the players from themselves a little bit, but also have the best players out on the pitch more often. Can you watch a game of football just as a fan? Or do you find yourself sort of drilling down into the technological parts of it? <laughs> no, I can still, can still manage to watch as a fan, thankfully. But in, in the back of the mind, there's certainly, you know, if, there's, if there's something that, that's going on with a decision being made or VAR, then... Yeah, of course, the mind drifts to <laughs> what, what's actually being done at that point. But no, I can definitely watch as a fan. And, and that's for me is, and, and my colleagues as well. It's the beauty of what we do is that you know, whilst we're sports scientists and we, we work as scientists in sport, we're, we're all sport fans. We've all played sport. We've worked at the highest level in, in various team sports around the world and other sports. And yeah, we're, we're fans. Um, so work is a very pleasurable thing. I'm pleased to hear it. It's been fascinating getting the chance to chat to you, Rob. Thanks for, uh, so much for being so generous with your time and, uh, and giving us an insight into your work. And we look forward to seeing where, where technology takes the game of football and other sports in the, uh, in the years to come. Thanks so much for taking our call. Thank you. 
thought-provoking, opinionated, enlightening. The Leighton Smith Podcast. What's wrong with New Zealand and how might we fix it? The politics of the country, the mood of the electorate, and government maladministration and stupidity. With input from Bruce Cottrell, Barry Soper, and a retired New Zealand lawyer. All on Podcast 184. Subscribe now on iHeartRadio and get the latest episode now. The Leighton Smith Podcast, powered by Newstalk ZB.